Welcome, everybody. Today's lecture will be about the general linear model, a true Swiss army knife of statistics. Before we get into the method, however, I would like to address the issue of causality. When we conduct deductive scientific research, we typically have a theory-driven hypothesis which we're testing on a data set. And we can define a hypothesis as a specific and testable prediction. We can define a theory as an explanation for some aspect of the natural world, which typically describes causal relationships between constructs. Our statistical model then represents those theoretical causal relationships, and the variables we measure represent our operationalizations of the constructs. Now, in some physical sciences, we can have very clearly defined theories. For example, we can have a theory about the maximum speed this uh, cylindrical shaped object will reach as it rolls down the wedge. And we can also hypothesize that forces like gravity and friction and acceleration will all weigh into the equation. So we can create a very clearly defined theory of the speed that this approximately cylindrical object will reach as it rolls down the wedge. However, in the social sciences, theories are often quite a bit messier. In the social sciences, we deal with people, and people have motivations and goals, and they have predispositions, all of which weigh into our theoretical frameworks. By analogy, what if the cylindrical-shaped object was actually a mouse? And what if the wedge was actually a block of cheese? Now, our mathematical theory of how fast this mouse will come down from the block of cheese doesn't apply anymore. In fact, the mouse probably enjoys the cheese, so it might stay up there a good long time. Just to illustrate that we are dealing with much more complex and unpredictable subject matter in the social sciences. We can define a structural equation model as a statistical model, which is a representation of our theoretical model. And the statistical model can represent all of the causal relationships and all of the assumptions which underlie our theory. A great advantage of structural equation modeling is that it can test all of these hypotheses and assumptions in one go. But we have to be careful about claims regarding causality. Maybe you recall from previous statistical courses that three conditions must be met in order for x to be a cause of y. The first condition is that there must be a relationship between x and y. The second one is that the predictor x must precede the outcome y in time. And the third condition is that the association must be non-spurious, and that is a fancy word for saying all other ex alternative causes for a relationship between x and y must be excluded. And of course we must also have a theoretically plausible mechanism by which x can affect y. Now, prediction is a little bit less stringent than causation. If we have a relationship between x and y, we can use x to predict values on y. And this prediction only requires there to be a relationship between the two. Anytime there's a relationship between x and y, we can use x to predict y, or conversely, we can use y to predict x. For example, if we know that there's a relationship between people's biological sex and their shoe size, and you give me um, a person which has a shoe size of uh, 43, then I can make a prediction that this person is probably a man. Whereas if you give me a person with a shoe size of 36, I can give you a prediction that this is probably a woman. Conversely, if you tell me, well, this person is a woman, what is your best prediction about her shoe size? My prediction would be lower than if you told me that this was a man. So prediction is not as stringent as causation. Now, the thing that you have to be aware of is that statistical models can represent associations between variables in different ways. They can describe those relationships. However, they cannot substantiate conclusions about causality. Conclusions about causality can be made on two grounds only. One is by means of the methods which we use to collect the data. Specifically, if our method excludes all alternative causes, then we can claim causality. And the one method that does this best is the randomized control experiment. And alternatively, we can have a good theory that postulates a causal relationship between two variables. And then our statistical model might find that the data support this relationship, but that does not mean that our model has proven a causal relationship. The second point is that there must be temporal precedence. Now, temporal precedence can occur because we manipulated the cause x, and then we observed the outcome y. 
or it could be because we conducted longitudinal research and we recorded the predictor x earlier than we recorded the outcome y, or we could argue for temporal precedence based on causal grounds. And this comes back to two research traditions which are prominent in the social sciences, experimental versus correlational research. Experimental research, by definition, meets all of the requirements for causality. Because experimental research manipulates the cause X, and then you typically have several conditions, a control condition and an experimental condition, and participants are randomly assigned to both of those conditions. The manipulation is applied, and then the outcome is recorded. Now this meets all of the requirements for causality. If you observe a relationship, you know that your manipulation has occurred prior to the outcome, because that is how your design was set up, and all other relevant variables are cancelled out through random assignment. And this is very important. Randomly assigning participants to one of your two conditions ensures that on average any differences between the groups are random and typically cancel out. Now there's no guarantee that there won't be any differences between the groups, but random assignment is the best way to ensure that there is a small probability of any differences between groups. Also note that random assignment is different from random sampling. Remember that random sampling is the best way to get a representative sample of a population, which improves the generalizability of your findings, and that is a different concept than random assignment, which makes sure that there's a minimal risk of systematic differences between your groups in your experimental design. Correlational research, on the other hand, can still make use of random sampling and thus maximize the generalizability of your findings. But in correlational research, we don't have the strict control that we have in experimental designs. Instead, you often find that correlational research measures a lot of other potentially relevant variables, and these are sometimes even called control variables. And you will find that researchers tend to include several of these control variables in their analysis. And then we can say that the effects of these control variables are partialed out. Or we also read sometimes that people say we controlled for these covariates. It's important to note that any causal interpretation of results from correlational research remains problematic because in reality, many outcomes are multi-determinant. There are a lot of different causes contributing to this outcome and it is practically impossible to control for all of these causes. So the burden of proof comes down to our theory. We must have a good theory, and then we can show that our data are in line with the theory, but we cannot definitively conclude that our theory explains why we observe the relationships in our data. Now to come back to those three conditions for causality, as I mentioned before, the first condition is that there must be a relationship between X and Y, and this can be simply demonstrated by examining a correlation or a t-test or a regression, any other measure of association between X and Y. The second condition is that there must be temporal precedence, so X must precede Y in time. If we don't have experimental research, then we could try to meet this requirement by either conducting longitudinal research or by logically arguing that X must precede Y in time. For example, if we hypothesize that attachment with the parents um, causes attachment with a romantic partner, but we only collect the data at one point, when people are 25, they still have their parents and they still have a romantic relationship, we can observe, we can measure people's attachment with their parents, and we can measure people's attachment with their romantic partner, then we might observe a relationship between those two constructs, and we might argue, based on logic, that attachment to the parent came earlier than attachment to the romantic partner, and that would be a good argument to argue that attachment with the parent might have some causal influence on attachment with the partner. But it doesn't conclusively demonstrate a causal relationship. For that, we would also need to prove that there is non-spuriousness, which means that the relationship between X and Y holds even if the influence of all other relevant variables are eliminated. Now, like I said before, this is practically not possible, but the way that researchers typically try to do it is by measuring control variables and by removing the influence of these controls by including them in the analysis.
Now, you're probably familiar with this example for a spurious relationship. On warm days in summer, more ice creams are eaten and also more burglaries are committed. Does that mean that eating ice cream causes burglaries? No, probably there is a very simple explanation. For example, warm days tend to occur in summer. In summer, people spend more time outdoors and they're eating ice creams there. But also more people are on holiday, so more houses are empty and empty houses are very attractive to burglars. So there's an alternative story that explains the association between the number of ice creams eaten on a given day and the number of burglaries committed. Sometimes you will find that researchers say they try to isolate the effect of X by removing the effect of other relevant variables on Y. We control for these other variables. And what we're left with is the unique effect of X after we already know what the effect is of all of the other relevant variables. And you will see two popular ways of controlling for confounders. One is experimentally controlling for them by randomly assigning participants to different conditions in a randomized controlled experiment. And the second technique is to statistically control for the influence of confounders by including these variables as a predictor in correlational research. And this brings me to the general linear model, a flexible modeling technique in which you can represent the effect of several predictors as a linear effect on one continuous outcome. Now you might already be familiar with several of the techniques on this slide. For example, factorial ANOVA, which is typically used with a continuous outcome variable when there are one or more categorical predictor variables, sometimes known as factors. Or you may have heard of ANCOVA, which is similar to ANOVA, except that there are also continuous control variables or covariates. And you might be familiar with multiple regression analysis in which there is a continuous outcome variable and there are several predictors which may be of continuous or categorical measurement level. But what you may not be familiar with is the fact that all of these techniques, including the t-test not represented on this slide, are examples of the general linear model. Let me explain why. Imagine that we have two groups, for example, men and women. Here are some sample data that men and women might have. Now, let's have a look at the plot first. Here we see the data of the women and we see the data of the men. We see that the scores of men on average are slightly higher than the scores of women. And we can represent that difference using a regression equation with an intercept here. And then if we go one step to the right, we go B steps up. That's the slope of the regression equation. And we end up with the average of men. Now, you're probably already familiar with this technique. You take the categorical predictor and you dummy code it. So you give one group the value 0 and the other group the value 1. Then you estimate your regression equation, which gives you an intercept and a slope for the dummy variable. The intercept represents the mean of the group which has 0 on the dummy variable. And the slope gives you the difference with a group that scores 1 on the dummy variable. We can see that regression equation below. The equation says that the predictions are equal to the intercept B0 plus the slope B1 times a dummy that codes for whether you're a man or not. Now let's look at the ANOVA way to represent the same group differences. Here we see the same values for men and the same values for women, just the same as in the plot on the left. Then we see that the mean for the women is here, the green line, is slightly lower than the average, and the mean for men, represented by this orange line, is slightly higher than the average. This too can be represented as an equation, and if we look at that equation, we see that the predictions are equal to one mean times a dummy for female, plus another mean times a dummy for men. In other words, the ANOVA specification uses two dummies, one for the group of men and one for the group of women, and it does not use an intercept. So the intercept has been replaced with an extra dummy. This means that the ANOVA specification gives us the means of both groups, and the regression specification gives us the mean of one group as the intercept, and then gives us the difference with the other group as a slope. 
Both models have the exact same number of parameters, however. They have two parameters. In the regression equation, one parameter is the mean for one group, and the other parameter is the difference with that group. And in the ANOVA specification, one parameter is the mean of group 1, and one parameter is the mean of group 2. And if we look at the output of these analyses for the regression and the ANOVA, the F tables are identical. We see the same sums of squares for the effective group and for the residuals. But if we look at the estimates, we see that in the regression specification, we get an intercept, which represents the mean value for women, and we get an effect of the dummy for male, which gives us the difference between men and women, and men score 1.35 points higher than women, on average. If we look at the ANOVA specification table, we see that there is a mean value for the group of women, which is the same as in the regression specification, but now we also get a mean value for the group of men, and the difference between these two groups is exactly 1.35. So both of these tables contain the exact same information. And from that we can conclude that regression and ANOVA are effectively the same. So now let's leave the app behind, although I really recommend that you play with it by yourself. And let's look at a formula. Here's the ANOVA specification of a comparison of three groups. In the ANOVA specification, you would estimate all three means. So we could say the outcome variable y sub i for every individual is equal to b0 times a dummy for group 1. So if you are in group 1, you get this value, b0, plus b1 times a dummy for group 2. So if you are in group 2, you get this value plus b2 times dummy for group 3, so if you're in group 3, you get this dummy, plus individual prediction error epsilon sub i. Now why is it okay to just chain all of these three groups together in one regression equation? Isn't there a risk that you get the value of group 0? Isn't there a risk that you get the value of group 1 plus the value of group 2? No, because you can never have a 1 on multiple dummies. The dummies code for group membership, so if I am in group 2, I have a value 1 on dummy 2, and I always have a value 0 on dummy 1 and dummy 3. So, in other words, the dummies for these three groups are completely orthogonal. People never have a value 1 on multiple dummies. Now, re the regression equation uses an intercept and two dummies. So you might remember from lectures on the regression technique that we say you always need one dummy less than the number of groups. That is because one of the group means is represented by the intercept of the regression equation. Then, if you're in group 1 or group 2, you get an extra little bump on top of that intercept. So if you're in group 1, your value consists of the intercept plus b1, and if you are in group 2, then your value consists of the intercept plus b2. If you are in group 3, then your value consists of the intercept. And everything that's left is prediction error epsilon sub i. Now hopefully I've been able to convince you that ANOVA is a special case or a different presentation of multiple regression analysis. Both of these analyses are just examples of the general linear model. So let's look at an example analysis conducted in R. We are interested in the effect of rejection on strategic shopping, which is shopping to enhance chances of inclusion with a group, buying something that group members will find attractive. Here is our research design. We have a participant view a video message from their research partner, someone they will be teamed up with later to conduct the research, together, in a team. Then we allow the participant to record a video message for their partner. And then we tell the participant that their partner has watched their video message and then decided to quit the experiment. An ambiguous situation. Our experiment has three conditions in which we manipulate rejection. Participants are randomly assigned to one of these three conditions. If they are in the rejection condition, then no reason is given for the partner's departure from the experiment. If they're in the neutral condition, then we tell participants, your partner said that they forgot an appointment and they had to quit the experiment. And if they are in the confirming condition, then we tell participants, 
Your partner forgot an appointment and they're really sorry that they can't continue the experiment. Afterwards, we tell participants that they will have to wait for a new partner, but while waiting for the new partner, they can spend $10 in a fake web shop with some university branded products and some neutral products. The outcome that we're interested in is how much money participants spend on university products. So the hypothesis is that participants in the rejection condition will spend more on university products than those in the neutral or confirming condition in order to maximize their chances of being accepted by the next partner who is also a university student. So let's analyze the data for this experiment in R. To conduct an ANOVA we can use the command AOV, short for analysis of variance. We can specify the effect of condition on how much money participants spend by saying spend tilde condition. Then we can ask for the summary of the fit model object by saying summary fit. And this is the table we obtain. This is an f-test table in which we see that there is an effect of condition with two degrees of freedom for condition. So there must be three groups because the degrees of freedom for condition is number of groups minus one. We see that the sum of squares explained by condition is 188.7. The mean square, which is the sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom, is 94.36, and that corresponds to an f value of 10.21 with a p value smaller than 0 0.001. We also get a line for the residuals. The residuals has a degrees of freedom of the number of participants minus the number of groups, so we had 59 participants. And the sum of squares for the residuals is 517.7, which corresponds to a mean square of 9.25. That's those 517 divided by the degrees of freedom again. And the F ratio is the mean square for condition divided by the mean square for the residuals. And we can already see because the mean square for condition was about 90 and the mean square for the residuals was about 9, that the F value is going to be around 10, which is true. Now we can also specify this same model by using the regression function, which is LM, short for linear model. If we want to get exactly the same model, then we have to say spend tilde condition minus one. So why do we have to say minus one? Well, because the regression function LM by default includes an intercept in our model. And an intercept is nothing other than a column with a value one for every participant. By saying minus one in the model formula, we tell R that we want to exclude the intercept for this model. So what do you get if you ask for the effect of condition without including an intercept? Well, you get an ANOVA with a mean for all of the three groups. And if we look at the summary of the fit model object, we see that indeed we get a mean for each of the three groups of condition. A mean for the confirming condition, a mean for the neutral condition, and a mean for the rejection condition. And we also see that people in the rejection condition bought significantly more than people in the confirming or neutral conditions. And below this table, we get some general information about the models. We see that the residual standard error is 3.0 for one, that it has 56 degrees of freedom. We see an R square for the model, which is how much variance in spending was explained by condition. And we get the F statistic and a P value. Note that this F statistic is slightly different. That is because a different sum of squares is used to compute it. If we simply ask for the regression specification without removing the intercept, then we see that an intercept is included and that intercept is the mean value of the confirming condition. And then we see that the effect of being in a neutral condition is the difference between the confirming and the neutral condition. And the effect of being in the rejection condition is the difference between being in the confirming and the rejection condition. Now, if we look at the p-values, what do these p-values tell us? The p-values for the dummies tell us whether there is a significant difference between the confirming and the neutral or the rejection condition. Whereas in the ANOVA specification, these p-values told us whether mean spending in each of those three conditions 
was significantly different from zero. Now let me show you something interesting. We can specify a model using the regression function ln, and we can ask for the effect of condition on spend. This is the regression specification. We don't remove the intercept, so our model will have an intercept. But then, after specifying the model as a regression, we can ask for an ANOVA table of the regression object. And what we get is the exact same table that we would have gotten if we estimated the model using the AOV function. If you look at this, this analysis of variance table is exactly the same as the analysis of variance table I showed you before when I used the AOV function to estimate my model. And what I'm trying to show you here is that analysis of variance is really exactly the same as regression. In fact, the AOV function in R is nothing but a wrapper for the LM function in R. That means that the AOV function just calls the LM function behind the scenes. So isn't that interesting? You don't need all of these different statistical techniques. All you need to know is how to estimate a linear model. And for that you can use ANOVA, you can use regression, you can use a t-test. All of those models are just examples of the general linear model. So now let's, let's look at another example of the general linear model, which is the ANCOVA. ANCOVA was typically used when the predictors were categorical and continuous. So you have some groups and you have some continuous covariates. This is another special case of the general linear model, and it was initially developed for use with experimental data. The purpose was to interpret differences between the groups. When we use random assignment, we should find that groups do not differ on covariates in any systematic way, although by pure chance it could of course happen that there are some differences anyway. If we then control for covariates, we reduce the unexplained variance in our outcome. And that gives us more power when examining the effect of the categorical predictor of interest. Usually these control variables are covariates that are not really of interest. In fact, a covariate is just another predictor, but it's a predictor that doesn't serve a theoretically important function. Now, I already mentioned this in passing when discussing the output in R, but the test statistic for analyses of variance is the f-statistic. And an f-statistic is a ratio of the explained part of the variance relative to the unexplained part of the variance. Below on the screen, we again have the summary table of our analysis of variance. And we see that we get a degrees of freedom, a sum of squares, and a mean square for both the effect of condition and for the residuals. Now the effect of condition is the explained part in the variance, and the effect of residuals is the unexplained part in the variance. If we look at the pie chart on the right, we see that there's a factor highlighted in pink, and there's an outcome y. The effect of the factor on the outcome y is the area where the two pie charts overlap, here indicated by lowercase f. The unexplained part of the outcome y is the part of the pie that doesn't overlap here indicated by the letter R. Now you can think of the F-test as answering the question, how big is that part F relative to that part R? And here's how we calculate it. We have to divide the mean square that is explained by the model by the mean square that is not explained by the model or the residual mean square. And that mean square is nothing else but a sum of squares divided by a degree of freedom. So, if we look at the effect of condition, we can take its sum of squares, that is the sum of squares explained by the model, and divide it by the degrees of freedom for the model. Now, this model has three parameters, because there are three groups, and that gives us number of parameters minus one equals two degrees of freedom. So, we divide that 175 by two, and we end up with about 87. Now for the residuals, the degrees of freedom are number of participants minus number of model parameters, which is in this case 56, so we must have had 59 participants. And the sum of squares is 603, so if we divide that by 56, we end up with a mean square of around 10. Now, 
Again, I promise that the F test will be the mean square is explained by the model divided by the mean square not explained by the model. So we get 87 divided by 10 is 8 point something. Then we can compute a p-value for this f statistic, and that is smaller than 0 0.001. Now, I programmed an app to illustrate where these sums of squares come from in ANOVA, and I would recommend everybody to have a look at this app after the lecture is finished. We can talk about the between groups sum of squares, which is also known as the model sum of squares in the previous slide, or the explained sum of squares, and its degrees of freedom. And the between group sum of squares is computed as the sum across all groups of the number of participants in that group multiplied by the mean of that group minus the grand mean across all groups squared. The degrees of freedom for the between variance is the number of groups minus one. Then we have the within group sum of squares, which is also known as the error sum of squares which is also known as the error sum of squares or residual sum of squares and its degrees of freedom. And it is computed as the sum for every individual's values minus the mean value of the group that they are in squared. In other words, the squared deviations of every person from their group's average. And the degrees of freedom for the within group sum of squares is the number of participants minus the number of groups. So here's that app that I developed. It really shows you where these different sums of squares come from. First, let's look at the between group variance. The between group variance is the sum of the squared deviations of all of the group means relative to the overall mean. So here in green is highlighted the overall mean and the blue lines represent the group means. And these red lines are the distances that are squared to get the between group sum of squares. Now the within group sum of squares, maybe you can already guess what that's going to be. Those are the deviations from the individual values relative to their group means. So the blue lines are again the group means, the black points are individual values, and the red lines are the deviations of every person relative to their group mean. The within group sum of squares is the sum of all of these squared deviations. And then finally we have a total sum of squares, and that is just the sum of the squared deviations of all individuals relative to the total mean, so relative to the green line. So the total sum of squares is the sum of these squared deviations. Now I showed you the f-test for the ANOVA before, but what happens if we include a covariate a control variable that explains some of the unexplained variance in our outcome. Well, let's look first at what happens to the pie chart. The blue circle again represents the variance in our outcome, and we explained part of our outcome as the effect of a factor, the factor being the variable of interest. For example, the influence of an experimental manipulation. Now we introduce the yellow circle, which represents a control variable or covariate. And that covariate is going to explain part of the blue circle as well. The result of this is that the unexplained part of the blue circle becomes smaller. So if we look at the f-test for the factor, the ratio of explained variance to unexplained variance has become larger because there is now less unexplained variance. In other words, it is easier to get a significant effect for the factor. So let's look at what happens if we do this in R. First, on top, we have an ANOVA with the effect of condition on money spent. And we see that the sum of squares for the effect of condition is 175, which gives us an F value of 8.13. Then, below, we conduct an ANOVA with a control variable, self-esteem. We control for self-esteem. So this is an ANCOVA, an ANOVA with a control variable. We see that self-esteem has a significant effect with a p-value of 0 0.007. And we also see that the residual sum of squares has become smaller. There is less remaining unexplained variance.
Now, in yellow, we see the highlighted F value for the effect of condition. And remember that this F value is the ratio of variance explained by condition div divided by unexplained variance. Because there is less unexplained variance after controlling for self-esteem, the F value has become bigger. So, the effect of condition has become more significant, whatever that means. Now, let's look at some of the assumptions traditionally associated with ANCOVA. Although I do want to emphasize that all of these assumptions apply to any model in the general linear model family. The first is that the model is correctly specified. And in the case of ANCOVA, one of the ways that the model could be misspecified is if there is an interaction between the factor and the covariate. So if we specify a model without this interaction, an assumption is that there is no interaction between the factor and the covariate. Another assumption is that there is homogeneity of residual variances. The residual variance must be equal across all of the groups and across all levels of the control variable. Moreover, of course, the variance must be normally distributed. We have to be particularly careful with the interpretation of an ANCOVA if there is a correlation between the factor and covariate. And this is no different from the problems caused by multicollinearity in the case of multiple regression, for example. Correlation between the factor and the covariate means that some of the same variance in the outcome is explained by the factor and by the covariate. Remember that I mentioned that all of these analyses are just examples of the general linear model. That means we can also think of ANCOVA as a regression with several dummy variables and a continuous predictor. Here is a formula of an ANCOVA analysis for the previous example. If we say that the amount of money spent is the outcome variable y, then this formula says that individual values on the outcome variable y are equal to some intercept b sub 0 plus a slope b1 times a dummy for people in the rejection condition plus a slope b2 for people in the confirmation condition plus a slope b3 for the self-esteem for every individual plus individual prediction error epsilon sub i. So one of the assumptions here is that there's no interaction between the factor coded for by the dummies reject and conf, and the covariate. In other words, the regression lines are parallel in the different groups. This assumption can be tested by also creating a model that includes the interaction and comparing the model fit of those two models. If the assumption is not met, you could decide to include the interaction in the model, although you have to indicate that this makes your analysis, at least in part, exploratory. So let's have a quick look at a shiny app with two factorial predictors. We have an effect of condition, there's an experimental and a control condition, and there is a factor gender, there are men and women. Now currently, for women, people in the treatment condition have a higher value than people in the control condition, and for men, people in the control condition have a higher value than people in the treatment condition. In other words, there is an interaction between the effect of condition and the effect of gender or sex. If we look at the ANOVA table over here, we see that one line has been highlighted in green to indicate that this effect is significant. There is no main effect of condition and no main effect of gender. How can we change that? Well, if we want to see a main effect of condition, then we would have to, for example, increase the value for, for condition for both sexes. So now we see that there is a significant effect of condition and also still an interaction between condition and gender because the difference between treatment and control is smaller for men than for women. If we want to see a significant effect of gender, then we could, for example, make sure that women have higher values than men. Now we see that there is a significant effect of gender as well but the interaction has disappeared. Why is this? Well, this is because the lines are now parallel to each other. Anytime they are parallel to each other, there will not be an interaction. For example, this also does not have an interaction. And neither does this. 
Now we see only a significant effect of condition, and no effect of sex, and no effect of the interaction between the two. Now I recommend that you play around with this Shiny app in order to learn for yourself what it looks like when there is an interaction and when there is not. We will proceed with these diagrammatic representations of ANCOVAS. We see these two little graphs here, with the dependent variable on the y-axis, a control variable on the x-axis, and we see a blue group, and this oval here indicates the data of that group, and a yellow group, and this oval indicates the data for that group. Now, the diagram on top shows a mean difference between the two groups, and an effect of the covariate. People with higher values on the covariate score lower on the dependent variable. And the diagram below shows a mean difference between the two groups, because the blue people score on average higher than the yellow people. An effect of the covariate, because the higher you score on the covariate, the lower you score on the dependent variable. But it also shows an interaction between the factor and the covariate because the effect of the covariate is much steeper for the blue group than for the yellow group. So let's zoom into that a little bit. Here is an example of an ANCOVA without interaction. If we run an ANCOVA on these data, we would control for the covariate, which means we can answer, for people who score zero on the covariate, how big is the mean difference? And then we look at the mean difference between group one and group two here. So this is the difference between the two groups that we will find in an ANCOVA without an interaction. We often recommend to center the control variables so that the mean value of the control variable is at the average value of the control variable. Then we can interpret the difference between the two groups as follows. For people who score average on the control variables, the difference between the two groups is, on average, this big. But we also see that if there is no interaction between the two groups, the difference between the two groups is equal at every value of the control variable. So if we center the variables at a much higher value, we see the same difference than if we center at the average value of the control variable or if we do not center at all. If there is an interaction between the control variable and the factor, however, that changes completely. Here we see that if we don't center the control variable, the difference between the two groups is about the same as when there was no interaction. But if we look at average values of the control variable, the difference between the two groups is much smaller. And if we look at even higher values, the difference between the two groups even reverses, so that now the yellow group scores higher than the blue group. In other words, when there is an interaction, the difference between the two groups depends on the value of the control variable. That means that if someone asks us how big is the difference between these two groups, we have to answer that depends on the value of the control variable that you're interested in. Now I already mentioned that ANOVA is a special case of multiple regression, and the same applies to ANCOVA. ANCOVA is just a special case or a different presentation of multiple regression. If you find a significant interaction effect in ANCOVA, you could run a regression with dummy variables that includes that interaction. So let's go back to the same example of strategic buying. We could represent individual values on the outcome as a regression equation. We have an intercept which represents the mean value of spending for people in a neutral condition. Then we have a slope times a dummy for people in a rejection condition, plus a slope Times a, times a dummy for people in the confirmation condition, plus a linear effect of self-esteem. And now we can include two interaction terms, one for each of the dummy variables for people in the rejection and people in the confirmation condition. So, people in the neutral condition, they have the effect of self-esteem represented by B3. People in the rejection condition they have an effect of self-esteem that is equal to B3 plus B4, and people in the confirmation condition have an effect of self-esteem equal to B3 plus B5. Note that the parameters B1 and B2 still represent group differences in the intercepts 
but for values of self-esteem equal to zero. So if you center the variable self-esteem so that zero is equal to the average value of self-esteem, then you could conclude that B1 is the difference between the neutral and rejection condition for people with average levels of self-esteem. Now it is important to note that if the factor and the covariate are correlated, this does not mean that there is an interaction. And if there is an interaction, it doesn't mean that the factor and the covariate are correlated. Let's have a quick look at these diagrams below. In the left diagram, in the left diagram there is no interaction and the factor and the covariate are not correlated. We see a main effect of the factor, the green line is higher than the orange line, and we see a main effect of the covariate, people with higher scores on the covariate score lower on the dependent variable, and there is no interaction because these two lines are parallel. In the middle picture we see that there is an interaction, so the effect of the covariate is stronger for the green group than for the orange group. And we can say that there is probably a mean difference between these two groups, because at least within the range of the observed data, all of the green participants score higher than all of the orange participants, and the effect of the covariate is positive for all of the observed ranges of the green and the orange data. Now here on the right, we see that there's a correlation between the factor and the covariate. People in the yellow group score lower on the covariate than people in the green group. And there is also a mean difference between the green and the orange group, at least within the observed range of the data. And there is a positive effect of the covariate within the observed range of the data. And there is an interaction because the effect of the covariate is stronger for the green group than for the orange group. So these latter two pictures illustrate that there can be an interaction between the factor and covariate regardless of whether the factor and the covariate are orthogonal, as in the middle picture, or correlated, as in the right picture. Now, the reading for this week discussed whether it is appropriate to use ANCOVA to compare existing groups that differ on some covariate. Now, when researchers do this, they often hope to make it as if the groups were equal on the covariate. But according to Miller and Chapman, this is not appropriate. They go as far as to say that ANCOVA cannot be used to investigate differences between existing groups. I don't agree with this extreme position, but I do think we have to be very careful about how we interpret the results of such an analysis. Here is an example of what could happen when you compare existing groups using ANCOVA. On the left, we see a pie chart for the ideal ANCOVA situation. The effect of the factor and the effect of the covariate are completely orthogonal. In other words, the factor does not correlate with the covariate. The covariate takes away some of the unexplained variance in the outcome, which helps us get a significant effect for the factor. On the right, we see a pie chart for what could go wrong when we apply an ANCOVA to existing groups. In this case, it could happen that the covariate is actually correlated with the factor, and the size of this overlap influences the results of our analysis. So here what we see is that the control variable does not just explain some of the unexplained variance in the outcome, it also overlaps with the effect of our factor, which means that the unique effect of the factor becomes somewhat smaller. There are several potential problems with this situation. One of the problems is that the grouping variable may very well have caused differences on the covariate. In other words, we are not looking at a multiple regression situation where the factor and the covariate have unique effects on the outcome. Instead, there is a mediation model where the grouping variable causes people to differ on the covariate and that covariate in turn causes people to differ on the outcome. In this case, when we control for the covariate, we end up underestimating the effect of the grouping variable on the outcome. A second possible problem is that there are other non-observed variables which account for differences in the outcome and in the grouping variable and in the covariate. And in this case, controlling for an observed variable does not help because there are other factors that are unaccounted for.
And a third possible problem is that we cannot extrapolate beyond the range of our data. For example, if these two naturally occurring groups have very different ranges of values on the covariate that don't even overlap, it's very hard to make a sensible comparison. The fourth possible problem is that if we try to select subgroups that do not differ on the covariate, so we have a lot of potential participants from both of the groups, and we find people with similar values on the control variable, then we end up with the problem of regression towards the mean. For example, have a look at this picture here. Let's say there's a red group and a blue group. And we try to find people with similar scores on the covariate. So we pick people who are within this range. Now, people within this range for the blue group score much lower than the average of their group. And people within this range for the red group score much higher than the average of their group. What tends to happen is that these people go back towards the average of their group. In other words, we've taken unrepresentative people of both groups, and the blue people are going to move up towards their group's average, and the red people are going to move down towards their group's average. And we have, again, unrepresentative samples. So when is it appropriate to compare existing groups using the general linear model. I think it's fine to do this as long as you don't claim that controlling for the covariates makes the group somehow equivalent or comparable. Just consider the covariates as another relevant variable and interpret their effects. In your discussion, always acknowledge that the group differences that you find might be due to some unmeasured causes. That's it for today. For some additional reading, I would like to refer you to these two websites. Good luck.